Well, hello again. I'll be talking about fractures in the hand of the uh, phalanges and the metacarpals. Um, so we're going to talk about phalanges first, the tuft or stellate fractures, bony mallet versus bony jersey, oblique or length unstable fractures, the jammed finger, proximal phalanx base fractures, metacarpal fractures is the next section. We'll talk about the boxer's fracture, mid-shaft or multiple metacarpal fractures, the Rolando Bennett fracture, and lastly we'll just talk about the carpal metacarpal fracture dislocation. Some of these things that I want to highlight are rare and I don't want you to miss them and that's why I'll also be talking about them. So I like to talk about silly things sometimes. Uh, we'll talk about how they got the word phalanges. It's a Greek word, uh, phalanx, or an organized battle line. And to Aristotle, if you look at all the phalanges, they look like a row of soldiers, and that's why they're called phalanges. Uh, the finger is a Saxon word. It means five, although we only have four fingers in the thumb, but that's why we have the word finger. So the distal phalanx fracture or a crush injury, you can have stellate ones, as you can see on the right, versus transverse fractures, and the mechanism is almost always a crush injury, got your finger caught in the car door, right? Very painful. It's usually a stable fracture because you have the nail plate dorsally and the pulp volarly. However, patients may have a nail bed laceration, and that's very common, and you may want to pop a hole in it to alleviate the pressure, which will alleviate the pain by draining out the blood. The textbook suggests if it's over 50%, but you talk to the patient and see what they want. That may help with their pain. And if they have a lot of nail missing, then you may want to repair the nail bed because there's nothing to protect it. I usually use a stack splint unless it's very displaced. And you always should mention, hey, listen, your nail may not grow back correctly ever again. Sort of like the extension with the radial head fracture. So sometimes you need to fix them, no matter how silly you feel. So this patient was seen by uh, an urgent care, and she got her finger crushed. It wasn't so bad, reasonably aligned. Uh, but then it started to displace, and I don't think that was very acceptable. So then I just pinned her, and she's much happier now that her nail looks appropriate and the bones aren't uh, sliding apart. Now, this is a recent study. Antibiotics are not usually needed in crush, fing crush finger injuries. So open distal phalanx fractures don't need prophylactic antibiotics. That's a new study that just came out, and that's provided that they are not grossly contaminated, and you've cleaned them relatively quickly after the injury. And that was uh, 2016 from the uh, European uh, Journal of Hand Surgery. And then this is an older one. This is more for the residents of the room, although I never dared to do this. You can use Dermabond to repair nail beds. Uh, there was a study that showed that Dermabond is faster than suture repair, so when you have lots of other consultations, that might save you a few minutes. Uh, it provides a similar cosmetic and functional result, and this was actually from 2008. So you may want to consider that in the emergency room. So then you have your avulsion fractures of the distal uh, phalanx, bony mallet. You're going to see that all the time. I see that maybe once a week, twice, once every other week. And then you have the bony jersey finger, which I see maybe once a year. So those are very different problems, even though there's the same bone and almost a very similar injury. So the mallet finger, it's almost always going to be a stack splint immobilization for about six weeks full time. You can't bend it. I tell patients anytime you bend it before six weeks, you've reset the clock to zero. And it's very annoying. I don't want to have this injury myself. Then you have to wear it for night or sporting activities for four weeks after uh, full immobilization for six weeks. And then sometimes the fingers get, get a little icky and soft, and I just tell them to put foot powder on, and that helps clear up the macerated skin. If the joint is not congruent, then you need to fix it. So you can see in the top right photo, it's sort of dislocating. That's not good. You need to fix that one. And how you f fix it, you flex down the finger, you place a blocking pin, and then you extend it back. So this is actually a very nice diagram. You can see the finger is flexed. You put in one K-wire, you extend, and then you go across the DIP. And that should hold it down for about four to six weeks, and then you can pull the pins. Uh, this is an only one uh, photo I can find, although I probably would not have uh, pinned this. This looks like it was a stable mallet finger. So now bony jersey, that's very rare, and that's kind of difficult to fix because you can imagine how small those bones are, but you have to put that bone back because that's where your uh, flexidigitorum profundus inserts. And there's just, uh, you can Google and find some nifty photos. And this is actually from a video of a very, very, very small plate and very small screws. So, but that's a much more difficult problem, so don't miss that one. Middle and proximal phalanx fractures. 
So sometimes you can get away with closed treatment if they're extra articular, if they're not very angulated, if they're not very short, if they're in a length stable fracture, which is usually uh, transverse or perpendicular to the uh, main uh, bone, and no rotational deformity. Intraarticular fractures if it's not very displaced, okay? And usually three to four weeks of immobilization uh, followed by aggressive motion. Sometimes I put the patients in a buddy loop, as you can see here, which is just a Velcro buddy tape, and then you put them in an intrinsic plus orthosis. And the intrinsic plus position, I think I had an extra S there for some reason, uh, is extension of the interphalangeal joints and flexion of the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint. And that's gonna keep the collaterals tight to avoid contraction. You can see the side view picture of the metacarpal head and the phalangeal head. And the axis of rotation or the location of the insertion is different in terms of the length going distal versus anterior versus distal versus anterior, and that determines whether or not the collaterals are tight or lax. So in extension, the collaterals are lax at the MCPJ, which you can see here, but they're tight at the inner phalangeal joint. So that's what you want to happen because you can see here, this is a little bit more uh, distance, so they're gonna be tight versus here where they're gonna be lax. And then the opposite is true in flexion. The collaterals are taut at the MCPJ, which you can see here, but they're lax at the IP joint. So that's why we put an intrinsic plus position. So length unstable, you have to fix it. This patient came to me, of course, she was wearing her wedding ring. Please take off the rings when you see patients because once their fingers swell up, it's very difficult to take them off. So she did not want an operation. I told her it's not gonna work, but I'll give her the old college try. So we got her nice and straight. And then she came back the following week and she didn't look very good. So then we took her to surgery. I probably could have just used one pin, but that's made her happy now that her finger is straight. So oblique spiral, obviously you need to fix this. Nothing's gonna support that. It's always gonna fall. You can do uh, closed reduction percutaneous pinning or ORAF. If you use screws, you don't necessarily need to use a plate because it's very small, I just put two pins across it and the patient's very happy. You take a clamp, you pull some traction, put the clamp on, reduce it, and then shush kebab it. Now this patient is 17 or 16 and she jammed her finger playing volleyball. Of course, I told mom, listen, this is, it looks good on the x-ray, but it may not stay. Of course, you tell mama bear, we're going to surgery, she's gonna bite your head off. We watched this for a month and it did not move, thankfully. So sometimes you can get away with it, but you need to keep close surveillance. She was uh, 16 or 17, and I just saw her at a month out, and it looks exactly the same. So hopefully it doesn't move. And young kids, you can potentially get away with that. So jammed finger, you're probably going to see this often. I do. So it's usually a very small avulsion fracture at the base of the, the volar base of the middle phalanx, which you can see here, and I blew it up for you. You're going to see something like this, a little crumb, something like that. In kids, they may have a lot of pain. You might want to put them in a splint for a few days and start moving them. In older patients, you got to move them soon, otherwise they're going to get a contraction. They're going to be very unhappy. So this is the easy one to, to take care of in your office. All right, the bad one is if it's a little bit larger. Don't miss those, because that's going to be a problem. So hyperextension or axial loading, avulsion of the volar plate, and this is the diagram. So the one I just showed you, you know, you can say maybe it was less than 15%, it's very stable. Once you involve more of the joint surface, it's gonna be unstable, and that's a very bad problem. And that's very difficult to fix. The thing that's in vogue now is called the hemihamate. You take a piece of bone from the hamate and you flip it upside down. You shotgun open the joint and you use tiny, tiny screws to recreate this. That's very complicated. But don't miss that, because it's a lot easier to do early on and then six weeks out. Pilon fractures, also don't miss this. Okay, the pedestal is a French word. Fracture of the middle phalanx of the PIP joint. That's a bad fracture, that's exploded. It doesn't look so bad on the x-ray, it's a small bone. You have to get a true lateral if you're in the ER or if you're in your office, because then you're gonna miss it. And then for me, I can get a CAT scan too, that's helpful. So it's a very bad jammed finger, it's very difficult to treat. The patients do not do well, the finger will never be the same again. You need to tell that to the patient. Okay, things to do, dynamic distraction x-fix, very complicated to do. You can imagine bending all these things, I don't know how people can remember it. 
I've never done it before because I use something else that's a little bit easier. But you get the CAT scan and this is all a bunch of crumbs, They're very small. How are you going to fix these tiny, tiny, tiny fractures? Less than, I mean, there might be a millimeter or so. So you put on this little itty bitty X fix. It looks very cute, right? Uh, and that helps to do a few things. One, it stabilizes the finger and then it distracts the joint. You can see here now we have some space, some space. And in the surgery, I got it to 90 degrees, which is very good. So here's some fracture uh, from the X-ray CT scan. These are tiny little pieces, but now you distract it. So you sort of recreate a joint and you're gonna spare the surface of the uh, proximal uh, phalanx head. Uh, and you can see these are tiny little pieces. You can't fix that, so you have to distract it. And then you keep them on and you keep pushing the patient to make a, a fist. Maybe you wanna give them some lidocaine before they go to the uh, hand therapist. And over time, she got almost all the way. This is her about uh, maybe two months out. So she was very pleased. It's a very bad injury, don't miss that. It's a lot easier to take care of uh, quickly. So uh, middle mid shaft pins. This patient, oh, I thought this was a slam dunk. This kid was doing push-ups with a 20, no, a 45 pound dumbbell on his back and it slid off and it crushed his finger. I thought that was an easy fracture to fix. Well, a few things. One, he was 17, so you can imagine his diaphysis or the intramedullary canal was teensy tiny. So it was very difficult to, for me to pin. And I had to use like the smallest K wires we had. I probably should have plated this patient. It was difficult to reduce and I needed to open. So don't be afraid of, of um, plating because now we have small plates. I was trying to do something like this where I just crisscrossed at the fracture so the patient's joints would be free, but it was very difficult to advance the K-wire because of the 17, his bone was super strong. So I had to do something like this. And although it wasn't wrong to do, it was difficult for him to fully extend and he wound up getting a slight contracture. So maybe I should have plated him. So just consider that if you're thinking potentially you may need that. There's very small little hand plates out there that don't cause as much stiffness as in the past. So please consider that. Proximal phalanx base fractures. You have to get a good lateral or oblique, right? So this doesn't look so bad. This is a patient that was sent to me a month out. This is in surgery. That doesn't look so bad. This is the x-ray from, I guess, the urgent care center she went to. I have no idea what's going on there. It doesn't look very good, but you can't tell because you have all these bones that are um, in front of each other. So you might want to consider a CT scan. So this is me in surgery. She had a very bad malunion at about 70 degrees. I just pronated and supinated her a little bit to identify it. So if you're not sure, make sure you play around with the position of the hand or get a CAT scan because you don't want to miss this. Okay, deformity is apex volar and that has to do with the pull of the uh, soft tissue. So the proximal phalanx is pulled into flexion by the inner osseous muscles, whereas the distal fragment is extended because of the central slip of the extensor mechanism. So what I had to do here is I had to do an osteotomy, corrective osteotomy, and I uh, sent the pin in. Now, the other thing that's important to see here is that if the base of the proximal phalanx is too small to capture a plate, and it's definitely too small to be um, stable with k wires, she can go through the metacarpal head. So that's what I did here, and I got her out of this extension. So avulsion fractures, the base of the phalange, sometimes you'll, you'll see it. Uh, which is down here, zoom in all the way, that's not going to heal. You need to recognize what part is the uh, articular surface, which is this piece here. So you can imagine this piece is supposed to be sort of like that. That's not going to heal correctly. This is the outside of the bone. This is where the collateral ligaments uh, attach. So please don't miss that. That's very important. Uh, there's a very esoteric way to treat this, which is a lot easier to to, to read about than to actually do, uh, sort of like you're doing a trigger finger release. You have to go through the A1 pulley to find this. The book shows you this. I have no idea how anyone could put a screw in this. It's very difficult to get your hand down that low. So then I used uh, some K wires to stabilize the fragment. So you have to be prepared in surgery to either do plan A, plan B, or plan C. So the textbook makes it easy, but it's not always like that. Boxers fractures, you probably see that often. Fifth metacarpal neck fracture, it's usually sustained after punching, that's why it's called a boxer's fracture, although it's a misnomer because boxers know how to punch and they use gloves and they don't get this fracture. Uh, you can 
find any line in any textbook to make you feel better about not treating this with surgery, but I don't know, 70 degrees of uh, flexion, they say in some papers is acceptable. I talk to the patient and see what they're interested in doing. If it's very displaced, then potentially the patient runs the risk of not being able to fully extend the finger. And with certain angulation, potentially that's not a problem, but if it gets too great, then I would like to fix it, especially if it's a younger patient. Uh, you do the joust maneuver, so what happens is you want to flex the patient at the MCPJ and at the uh, PIP joint, and then you push back and you reduce it. And it's named after this guy, Samuel Joust, uh, who's uh, from uh, Newark, but went to Long Island College Hospital, which is not there anymore. And he actually worked at Knickerbocker Hospital, and then he went to Hospital for Joint Diseases, and he wrote about this in the uh, 1950s. Uh, in the shaft, same idea. You can have acceptable degrees of angulation. And I sort of start feeling bad when things are very, very, very displaced, especially in a young person. It's going to be painful if they have to grip something because the shaft is now in their palm. So I think you need to have a conversation with the patient. If it's very displaced or very shortened, that's not going to do well. You can see his middle finger in this patient is about the same as uh, his ring finger. So we took him to surgery and we put in three screws and he got back to moving right away. This is very important if anyone's operating on these. This is called the hour back clamp, okay? It is a front to back clamp. If you're trying to take a small towel uh, clamp or a traditional bone reduction forceps, it's very difficult to get the forceps on either side of the fracture because you have other bones. I was a fellow doing this fracture and I spent an hour trying to do it and I could not and it was very infuriating and the nurses brought this striker set out and they gave me this thing and I put it on one, two, three, it took me 15 minutes to do the case and they, I asked them, well, what's the name of this? And they said, hour back and they said, well, I wish I had that hour back and that's how I remember this. So when you're having frustrations, get the hour back clamp. Some people call it the syringe clamp because it looks like a syringe, but that was a lifesaver for me. Fractures heal quickly. This kid was 17. He came to my office two weeks out. What's all of this? That's all callus. So you have to fix these quickly. Otherwise, you're going to do an osteotomy, which I did here because it was healed. Multiple metacarpal fractures. It's not terrible, but they're unstable because you have two. So usually if you have one, let's say you just had this one, his neighbors will hold them up. But if you have two of them broken, it's not the easiest thing to do, and you should secure them. The Fourth, metacarpal is usually the thinnest, so you can't fit too many in. It's okay. You don't need to put in two. One is enough. Multiple metacarpal fractures. This kid was um, on a half pipe uh, uh, sn snowboarding, and uh, he landed wrong. Uh, obviously, you can't treat this closed because there's no way you can put a splint on this. It's too much swelling. And if you go to put plates and screws on here, how am I going to close all those uh, wounds, especially if you've taken up volume with a plate? So then I just pinned him and he wound up doing okay. But it's not wrong to use uh, lots of little pins. This is a new thing, retrograde intramedullary screws. And there was a recent article that was published which showed that there was a shorter mean surgery duration, meaning it takes you quicker to put in a little intramedullary screw than actually doing the old-fashioned plate and screws. And for the patients, it's a shorter return time to work because you don't have K-wires in the way of motion. And this came out, I think, this month or last month uh, from the hand. It's called Hand. That's the journal. It's the other journal of one of the other hand societies. Now, I have not done this yet. I would like to do it soon. But I advise you, if you're interested in doing that, probably do a cadaver course. And basically what they showed, uh, they compared K-wires, plates versus these intramedullary screws. And that's what they studied. They did it on both metacarpals and in uh, phalanx fractures. My concern is, well, how do I get this out if there's a problem? But then again, someone might say, well, you put in a headless screw into the scaphoid. So why can't you put it into this bone? There are problems. So not every single fracture can get this. You can see this patient had sort of a boxes fracture. It didn't do well. It couldn't purchase down by the CMC joint. Uh, so it's not a, a home run every single time. So be careful if you choose to use it. Uh, the Bennett fracture, an oblique intraarticular fracture dislocation of the base of the first metacarpal or the thumb. Axial loading, the patient is slightly flexed during that process. It's named after this guy, Edward Bennett. Uh, he was from the turn of the last century uh, in uh, uh, Trinity College in Ireland, and he actually introduced Lister's antiseptic technique. That's why we have Listerine. And he talked about this in 1882. 
there's a lot of deforming forces for the residents. They always ask about this. Uh, the volar ulnar fragment, or the small little piece here, that stays put, and that's because of the volar antique, uh, excuse me, the volar anterior oblique ligament, or the volar beak ligament, that holds that fragment in place. The large distal fragment has multiple muscle attachments. The abductor pollicis longus, which you see here, pulls the fragment proximally, whereas the adductor pollicis brevis, which is the deepest muscle in the hand, and that's pulling the fragment uh, dorsal or close to the palm, and that helps supinate it and gives you a little bit of flexion deformity. And to reduce it, you just need to do the opposite. So you have to pull some traction. You have to extend, which they're sort of showing with the thumb, uh, and the uh, index finger of the person pulling it sort of gives you that extension and abduction, and then you need to pronate, which they don't show here, but you just need to sort of put your hand like you're riding the motorcycle, cock up your wrist. Uh, for me, when I have to see, uh, take care of this surgically, I use a Wagner incision or a Wagner incision, which is going around the glabrous, non-glabrous skin of the thenar muscles, and you have to find your nerve branch, and you have to move things out of the way, access the joint, do your rotation. Sometimes you need to put in a... Um, curette to hold the piece in place, and then you can uh, put in some uh, K-wire. So this patient of mine, very small fragment, but she was like 17, so I said we should fix this so you don't get arthritis. I probably could have used less pins and uh, smaller pins, but you want to do two things. Number one, you want to pin the fragment, and then you want to pin the joint. These pins, the textbooks say, should be in for six weeks. This pin is for four weeks. So unfortunately, after you do that, you have to cast it put uh, zero form around the wires. You have to change the cast every two weeks to make sure they don't get an infection, and the patients do reasonably well. Uh, Rolando fracture, which is sort of a cousin of the uh, Bennett fracture, a T, a Y-shaped fracture, intraarticular on both sides, all right, less common than in Bennett. I don't normally see it. It's, however, more severe. It's named after this man, Silvio Rolando, who's also an Italian surgeon, although he was uh, from urology, and he had the, the newest thing back in the day, which was an X-ray, and he took X-rays of everything, and he actually wrote a case report on this. Uh, basically, there's three main fragments, two articular, one shaft, so you want to put the two fragments of the articular component together, and then you want to make uh, from three, you make two, and then from two, you make one. And now they have fancy hand plates to actually capture all the fragments. This is an older model, but basically you want to make sure that you've bent the plate slightly so the screw does not enter the joint. If you don't bend it, it may go into the joint, so be mindful of that. This is the last one, CMC fracture dislocation or carpometacarpal injury. It's the other boxer's fracture. Uh, difficult to treat closed due to swelling, so you need to either pin it or uh, plate it or open it and pin it. And here's another uh, example uh, of a patient of mine. It doesn't look terrible, but there's something going on here. You see the lateral, it's sort of dislocating or subluxed. Here's an oblique, doesn't look good. When you get the CAT scan, you can see the little fragments of pieces. So it's very difficult to fix these. So you have to pin things to hold them up to preserve the joint and maybe uh, pin the smaller articular fragments. And you want to get into the hamate bone because that's going to also give you stability. And thank you very much. And I have some business cards out front. Thank you.